Hello, welcome and thank you. Together, we, Northeast Delta Human Services Authority, and you are building stronger communities together, one person at a time. Northeast Delta HSA is a trusted resource for credible information, evidence-based programs, and guidance. We are adapting our services to meet community behavioral, physical, mental, and social health needs. Northeast Delta Human Services Authority is led by Dr. Montez A. Sizer, Executive Director. Collectively, we are all directed by our vision, mission, and tenets. Our vision, to build a unified Northeast Louisiana where individuals are thriving and reaching their full human potential. Our mission, to serve as a catalyst for individuals with mental health, developmental disabilities, and addictive disorders and our tenants that guide our actions. Greater access to services, excellent customer service, and quality, competent care. This webinar series by the Prevention and Wellness Team at Northeast Delta HSA is here to improve education awareness, advance community discourse, and focus on recovery during social distancing and other issues enhanced by COVID-19. Today's topic, Transforming Grief Talk, the role of grief and loss in addiction recovery with Nina Middlebury. Hello, and again, welcome. I am Nina Littleberry, the presenter for the training this afternoon. I am a licensed master social worker for the state of Louisiana for 24 years. I am a grief recovery method specialist trained and certified by the Grief Recovery Institute. I am currently serving in the role as a grief counselor with Northeast Delta Human Services Authority in the Department of Prevention and Wellness. The Grief Recovery Method is an evidence-based practice that addresses grief. The content provided for this presentation is sourced to the Grief Recovery Handbook written by John W. James, and Russell Friedman, founders of the Grief Recovery Institute. Our agenda for this afternoon is introduction to grief recovery, grief recovery lesson, grief recovery exercises. I will guide you on how to complete a loss graph, a relationship graph, and how to write a goodbye letter. If you would like to participate in the grief recovery exercises along with me, you will need the following items some paper and a writing utensil, a pencil or pen, whichever you prefer. And at the end of the training, there will be a question and answer period. The objectives for the grief recovery training are, you will learn some choices that will help you to achieve recovery from grief, dispel myths about grievers, communicate in writing your true and honest feelings, this is done by completing a relationship graph and a goodbye letter. And you will learn how to complete a loss graph, a relationship graph, and write a goodbye letter. The goal of grief recovery is to help complete relationships lost to pain, isolation, and loneliness caused by a significant emotional loss. The grief recovery method will provide you with some tools to give you an opportunity to develop skills for coping with grief. It is the goal to help you discover and complete what was left emotionally incomplete by a death, a divorce, or any other loss. Grief recovery encourages you to be honest with yourself about your true feelings. Let's look at commitment. Typically, I facilitate grief recovery in a group setting for four consecutive weeks, and the group members pledge to three commitments. These commitments can be considered the cornerstone for grief recovery. Let's look at the first commitment, total honesty. You can only achieve emotional completeness by telling the truth, meaning that you share what you want to share or feel comfortable with sharing. Just be mindful to be truthful about what you choose to share. 
absolute confidentiality. This means if you share information with me, that information is kept between you and I. Now, however, there are times when confidentiality is breached, meaning that the issue of concern is no longer confidential. For example, if a client tells you that he is going to harm himself or someone else, or there's a report of maltreatment or abuse to self or others, as a clinician, I have an ethical obligation to maintain safety for clients and others. Therefore, I am mandated to make a report to the appropriate authorities in regards to these issues of concern. Lastly, uniqueness and individuality. Every relationship is unique. Let me dissect. For example, your relationship with your spouse is different from your relationship with your coworker. Your relationship with your coworker is different from the relationship with your children. Let me dissect just a little more. A mother can have five children, and each child has a different relationship with that mother. No one else's opinion about our relationships to people who have affected our lives is solicited or helpful. So please allow others the respect and dignity to share their thoughts and feelings without analysis, criticism, or judgment. In light of COVID-19, the COVID-19 pandemic has caused a domino effect that has caused grief and numerous losses from death of family and friends, our sense of safety, to our social connection, to our financial security. Every entity and every individual of America has been affected directly or indirectly by COVID-19. Some of us have lost family, members, and friends to death. Some of us have been furloughed from work, loss of pay, decrease in working hours. As a result of these major changes, our various financial situations have suffered severely. Our youth went from the traditional classroom settings to being homeschooled, and the working class are having to work from home, in particular, non-essential workers, which has caused a major disruption in our daily activities. Essential workers, such as the people who stock the grocery store shelves, environmental workers, the keepers of the facilities, first responders, law enforcement, emergency medical technicians, firemen, our frontline workers, nurse assistants, nurses, doctors, counselors, social workers, peer support, have dedicated their services entirely. We have been limited with our physical and social interaction with family and friends as a result, our support systems and socialization have been minimized to isolation as we are not able to attend our various places of worship, celebrate special occasions with family and friends, and simply spend pastime with family and friends. The level of anxiety has increased as persons are worried about the safety of their physical well-being and finances afraid of contracting COVID-19 virus and the spread of the virus to family and friends, as well as worried about not having enough money to pay their bills or put food on the table. Let's turn our attention to two high-risk populations, the mentally ill and persons that suffer with substance addictions. These populations are vulnerable and require a lot of support, both professional and non-professional. When dealing with stressors, these populations oftentimes have more challenges with managing stressors of everyday life. The burden of carrying some of these stressors that have been previously mentioned can, and in some cases, have caused persons in these populations to relapse. Looking at a relapse from the mentally ill and persons with substance addictions, these persons have learned coping skills to address their various mental illnesses and substance addiction. However, during this very stressful time of COVID-19, they have found that their coping skills that they have used in the past are not working. And this has caused a grief period for some of these persons. Grieving is a process that takes on various emotions. 
some of which will be identified later during this presentation. Each person grieves differently. As a result, the length and intensity of the emotions people go through varies from person to person. A grieving period could be short for one person and longer for another. There is no direct sign as to how long a person will or should grieve. However, there are some factors that affect the intensity and length of the grieving period, such as your relationship with the person who died, the circumstances of their death, and your own life ex experiences. For clinicians, as we assess cases, let us be mindful of the mode of treatment that will yield the most productive behaviors versus kind of productive behaviors. Let's take a look at how grief is defined by the Grief Recovery Institute. Grief is a normal and natural reaction to loss or change in a familiar pattern of behavior, such as not being able to go into the workplace and interact with co coworkers, as many of us have developed working and social relationships with coworkers, students not being able to be in the classroom with one another, as they support and share with one another their thoughts, ideas, accomplishments, and even disappointments. Not being able to utilize our support systems to the fullest, such as AA, Alcoholic Anonymous, NA, Narcotic Anonymous, Outpatient Behavior Health Services, not being able to meet at our respectful places of worship, or just simply not being able to be about our normal daily routines. Unresolved grief is almost always about things we wish we could have said or done differently, better, or more. Let's take a look at some examples of this. I wish I had told dad that I loved him before it was too late. Or I wish I had visited grandma before she died so I could have told her what she meant to me. Even in the best of relationships, we are often left with plans that never got to happen. Grief recovery will show you how to discover and communicate those unsaid things so that they no longer limit you or affect your capacity for happiness. The expressions of communications are oftentimes accompanied by tears. Don't be fearful or think something to be strange with you. If you began to shed tears, when you start to express your communication. You see, oftentimes people will cry. They become vulnerable and began to feel comfortable with letting their emotions flow. Finally, unresolved grief is about undelivered communication of an emotional nature. Now that we have identified what unresolved grief is, I expect that you are now wondering and interested to know, how do I feel better or gain the full capacity for happiness? Let's define completeness. Completeness is the result of having delivered those emotional communications that either we never made or we felt were never heard or that need to be said again with someone hearing you say them. Now remember that your emotional communications are not to be said in person to the person you are grieving. Now, let's look at an example of what we just learned about completeness. For example, you might have suffered emotional, physical, or sexual abuse. You told someone about it, but nothing was done. So you may feel like you were ignored, not protected, and that nobody cared about how you felt. Or maybe you were too afraid to tell anyone about it. And simply, it might be that you have lost your emotional communication, but you just need to say it again to release the frustration and pain that you may be feeling. Again, let me remind you that when you began to express your feelings by way of emotional communication, you may find that the tears began to fall. You are simply allowing yourself to be vulnerable as you let your feelings flow naturally. Completeness gives you the ability to say goodbye to any pain which may be limiting you from fond memories and saying goodbye to any unmet dreams, hopes, and expectations about the future.
common losses. Oftentimes, when we hear the word grief, what comes to mind is death and divorce. These are two common losses that people grieve. However, there are more than 40 plus life events that can produce feelings of grief. Let's look at some of the losses that people grieve. Loss of a job or even being looked over for a job promotion. Retirement. When we hear the word retirement, we often think in terms of happiness. We work to retire. Many times we find ourselves saying, I can't wait until I retire. When that day comes and we go home, sometime later, we may find ourselves in a sad and lonely place because there has been a change in a familiar pattern of behavior of going into the workplace for the past 25 to 30 years. Loss of relationships with family and friends. This is common with the mentally ill and persons who suffer with substance addiction, as family and friends oftentimes become frustrated with the behaviors of persons in these populations, and likewise, as they become frustrated with the behaviors of family and friends. Loss of limbs, loss of joy and happiness. This is common when we lose persons to death or relationships end in a breakup. Loss of hopes and dreams. What comes to mind are couples that marry and pledge their love to grow old together. After retirement, they plan to travel and see the world together. However, the relationship may end in death or divorce. Loss of a sense of security and safety. Let's look at our seniors for a moment. When you began to grow into your golden years, oftentimes the physical body begins to change as it starts to deteriorate. You may start to feel that your physical safety is at risk as your independence declines. Whatever your loss is, grief recovery does not practice telling you how you feel or claim to know how you feel because I don't and neither does anyone else. At best, we know how we felt when our loss occurred. All relationships are unique. Therefore, each person grief is different. Also, it is important to recognize and know that grievers are not broken. Therefore, they don't need to be fixed, analyzed, criticized or judged. They just simply need to be listened to with dignity and respect. The grief recovery method is non-judgmental, and it is important that we don't compare our pain and losses with others. There are various emotions that are part of the grieving process, such as sadness, frustration, anger, and loneliness. These emotions can make it difficult to navigate through life as we manage day-to-day -day challenges. Now let's take a look at myths about grievance. Don't feel bad. Replace the loss. Grieve alone. Just take time. Be strong for others. Keep busy. These tools have proven to not be helpful. Let me paint a picture of how not having the necessary tools to accomplish a task or goal can be unproductive or not helpful. Imagine that you're preparing to paint a room. Think about the tools that you would need to paint the room. You would need some paint and some paint brushes. A screwdriver or a rag would not be tools that you would use to paint the room, as these are not tools used for painting. In other words, you will need the necessary tools and skills to accomplish the task. Let's look at the myth, be strong for others. This is a very common myth. Be reminded that grieving is painful. People grieve differently. Unsolicited comments and statements have proven to not be helpful. And it is important that those who suffer a loss be allowed the time they need to express their grief, not to be judged, analyzed, 
or criticized. We have difficulty dealing with grief because oftentimes we have been given tools that don't work, such as the myths that are listed. Those tools have been ingrained in us. As we have passed down these myths or tools from generation to generation, as a result, we often find grievers stifling their feelings. Oftentimes when our feelings or emotions are kept on the inside, it will lead to short-term energy-releasing behaviors in search of relief from emotional pain. That will lead us into our next slide here. Sturbs are your short-term energy-releasing behaviors that persons seek for immediate relief of emotional pain and frustration. Let's just look down this list real quick. We have food, alcohol and drugs, anger, exercise, fantasy, isolation, sex, shopping, workaholism. I want to just take some time to highlight alcohol and drugs as being a common short-term energy releasing behavior. When we deal with the daily stresses of our home, work, and personal lives, sometimes the stress can become overwhelming, creating a challenge for us to manage the stress and eventually leading to grief. As a result, you might find yourself taking a drink of wine to unwind after the work day after dealing with many challenges. The next day, you might find yourself taking two glasses of wine to unwind as you continue to deal with the challenges on the job. And before you know it, you are drinking a whole bottle of wine in one setting to cope with your grief. Or you might decide to take medicine prescribed by the doctor to manage anxiety. And as the stresses of your daily activities increases, you find yourself taking more of the medicine because you're beginning to need more of the medicine to manage the grief and the symptoms that come with grieving. When you are no longer able to get the medicine prescribed by your doctor, you may begin to ask others for their medicine or even take illicit drugs such as cocaine, heroin, and meth to help you cope with the grief. Again, serves your short-term energy releasing behaviors or a temporary fix. As the presentation continues, you will be provided with some tools that will allow you the opportunity to address grief in a positive and helpful manner that will yield more productive behaviors and a longer lasting effect versus a temporary effect. Intellectual statements. Bystanders, those persons who are not grieving, they tend to minimize the griever's emotions and place much emphasis on the intellect, causing grievers to suppress their feelings and thoughts. Intellectual statements is an attempt to shift from emotions to intellect. This is dangerous and counterproductive. How so? The grieving person begins to feel like, what I'm doing is not natural. I should not be showing my emotions of how I feel about my loss. As a result, the grieving person begins to stifle or suppress their feelings. Let's look at some of the intellectual statements that bystanders tend to say to grieving persons. Be thankful you have another son or daughter. The living goes on. He or she is in a better place. All things must pass. He or she led a full life. He or she was not good for you. You will find somebody else. God will never give you more than you can handle. Be grateful you had him or her for so long. Now, I will guide you on how to complete a loss graph. Let's look at the instructions on how to set up a loss history graph. You will need a sheet of paper. Turn the paper horizontally. Next, draw a line horizontally in the center of the paper. This is a loss history graph of a person that is 50 years old. We will find the center point of the loss history graph by taking half of the person's age which is 25 years old, 
Then you will mark the center point with a dot. As you can see here, 1995 marks the center point of this person's lost history graph. As this person was 25 years old in 1995. The lost history graph starts with 1976 as the person will record their first memory of a loss. Your positive thoughts, actions, and statements are to be recorded above the line. Your negative thoughts, actions, and statements are to be recorded below the line. Now, let's look at a completed loss history graph. First, let's take a look at the bottom of the graph. You will see listed misinformation or miss. These terms are interchangeable. The person records myths that have been encountered, such as, you don't need him or be strong. Undisturbs your short-term energy releasing behaviors. The person has recorded shopping, excessive spending of money and exercising. Under accident, the person records a 2018 car accident. Under illnesses, the person records anxiety. Now, let's turn our attention to the lost history graph. 1976 is where the lost history graph begins, as the person records the death of their father as their first memory of a loss. Below the recording, in quotation marks, it states, I don't understand why you had to leave. 1977, the person records a loss of friends after moving to a new neighborhood as well as changing schools. 1979, the person records a physical loss when the person's sister moved out, moved out of the home onto a school campus after graduating from high school. Above the line, in conjunction with this loss, the person records a positive statement. I'm excited about seeing your new place and your success. 1984, the person records a physical and emotional loss when the person's sister moved 1,800 miles away. Here you will see that the person recorded a negative statement listed below the line, I'm angry at you for leaving me all alone. 1986, the lost history graph reflects a recording of a relationship with a boyfriend that ended. And this is where this lost history graph ends. Now let's turn our attention to relationships. There are three aspects of relationships, physical, emotional, and spiritual. Let's look at the physical. For example, death ends the physical relationship, whereas divorce changes the physical relationship that you had with a spouse. Emotional, all feelings we have about another person, pet, or things. Some of us have pets, and our pets are like family. If something would happen to our pets, we would grieve as we would about a family member. Finally, spiritual. The spiritual aspect is neither physical or emotional. It is the intangible, those things that you can't see or touch. Let's dissect that statement or go into spiritual a little bit more to get a more in-depth meaning of this. What comes to mind is, from mother to mother, one mother could have relatable feelings or emotions to another mother, or there could be a connection from a mother to someone else's child, as a mother could see or feel something about that child that reminds that mother of her child or being a mother. This section of the training will give us an opportunity to address a relationship graph. To communicate and complete the discovery made in your relationship graph, you must first put them into one of the following categories, apologies, forgiveness, or significant emotional statements. Let's look at apologies. In this category, the primary concern is with you and your perceptions of your own actions 
or non-action. In this section, you will hear the word you used a lot and emphasis placed on that word. Again, this is very important that you highlight this, place emphasis here, because the apology is not about the other person, it is about you beginning to release the hurt and pain to put you on the path of being restored. For the most part, apologies are for you. Occasionally, an, apo an apology can be made to a living person. Now, let me warn you, if you're considering making an apology to a living person, please be very careful as you consider the pros and cons of this decision. Remember that apologies are about you. The other person's perception might be totally different from yours, causing a potential setback for you or counterproductive behaviors. Now, let's look at some examples of apologies for something you did or did not do that might have hurt someone else. You may owe an apology for something you actually did. For example, I'm sorry for taking the money from your purse. Or you may owe an apology for something you did not do. For example, I'm sorry I didn't visit you in the hospital. Or you may not have communicated something positive before a death or divorce. For example, I'm sorry for not thanking you for the present. Forgiveness. People oftentimes confuse the word forgive with condone. It is important that we understand that forgiveness does not mean that you are in agreement with what a person might have done to you. It does not mean that you're going to go back to certain relationships or whatever happened in the relationship had no merit. However, it does mean that you will let go of the resentment that causes pain and hurt from the relationship. Continued resentment and inability to forgive hurts you, not the other person. I want to take just a few minutes and imagine that the perpetrator has died, that person that has caused you hurt and pain. Can your continued resentment hurt him or her? Clearly not. Can it harm you? Unfortunately, yes. An unsolicited statement of forgiveness is almost always perceived as an attack. You may say, I forgive you, and the other person may feel like, I have not done anything to be forgiven for. Remember, never to forgive anyone directly to their face. Again, this is about you, the release of your pain, anger, and frustration. Now let's look at some examples of forgiveness statements. Acknowledge is an interchangeable term uh, for forgive. I acknowledge the things that you did or did not do hurt me, and I'm not going to let them hurt me anymore. Or I acknowledge the things that you did or did not do hurt me, and I'm not going to let my memories of those incidents hurt me anymore. Significant emotional statements. Any undelivered emotional communications that is neither an apology or forgiveness falls into this category. This is now your opportunity to say whatever you are feeling. It is never appropriate to make negative, significant emotional statements in person. Some examples of significant emotional statements are, I love you, I hate you, which is a negative, significant emotional statement. I was very proud of you. Thank you for the sacrifices you made for me. I appreciate the time you spent with me. Now, I'm going to guide you through a relationship graph as we take the information that has been introduced in this section and apply it to a relationship graph. Let's look at the instructions on how to set up a relationship graph. You will need a sheet of paper. Turn your paper horizontally. Next, draw a line horizontally in the center of the paper. 
This is a relationship graph of one cousin graphing her relationship with another cousin. You will begin the graph from the left, starting with your first and fondest memory of the relationship being graphed. The cousin records 1972 as the first and fondest memory of the relationship. You will continue to graph events that occurred in the relationship in the order that the events occurred. Dates don't have to be exact. You can give approximate dates. And you see SES stands for Significant Emotional Statements. These statements are recorded above and below the line. Above the line indicates positive statements, and below the line indicates negative statements. The A represents apologies that are to be recorded above the line. The F represents forgiveness that are to be recorded below the line. Now, let's look at a completed relationship graph. I'll give you just a few minutes to scan your eyes across there. Be reminded that this is a relationship graph of a cousin graphing her relationship with another cousin. Let's take a look at the bottom of the graph. You will see listed apologies, forgiveness, and significant emotional statements. Under apologies, the person has recorded an apology. I apologize for saying hurtful things and calling you names. Under forgiveness, the person has recorded a forgiveness statement. I acknowledge that you did not step up to the plate with putting things in order for taking care of auntie. Significant emotional statement recorded. I was hurt and disappointed with you for not standing as my older cousin during the family crisis with auntie. The information recorded in these three categories serves as a reference to help guide you with your relationship graph. In 1972, this person records her first and fondest memory with her cousin, spending quality time in the home with cousin and family. Above the line, a positive significant emotional statement is recorded in conjunction with this memory. I enjoyed the family time. 2006, this person records a memory of her cousin's daughter's wedding. 2007 reflects the death of the cousin's husband. In conjunction with this memory, there's a positive significant emotional statement recorded above the line. I have no regrets spending time in the home with cousin after the death of her husband. 2013 reflects that the cousin's mother had a stroke. In conjunction with this memory, there's a positive significant emotional statement no regrets for helping to take care of my cousin's mother. 2014 through 2016 is where the relationship seems to spiral down, as indicated with the recordings of excessive arguing and calling a name, as well as the cousin stops speaking to her cousin. The significant emotional statement in conjunction with this time frame is negative, as it is recorded below the line and states, I don't like you. In 2017, there continues to be some disputes between the cousins. However, in 2017, this person begins to make some apologies to the cousin, as indicated by the statements listed above the line. I apologize for saying hurtful things to you. In 2018, the tension between the two cousins began to decline, as well as some forgiveness takes place as indicated by the statement listed below the line in conjunction with this time period, I forgive you for not taking charge of the family crisis. The relationship graph ends in 2018 as it has been completed. Now, when you get the opportunity, I want to encourage you to try and graph your losses as well as the relationship graph. If the graph becomes overwhelming, because you can't remember the instructions on how to complete the graph, or you don't feel like you're doing it right, or just remembering certain losses or events has caused you to become emotional, take a break from the graph. You can complete your graph at your leisure.
want you to feel free to contact me by email or telephone with questions and concerns, and I can assist you with setting up an appointment for a grief recovery session by telephone. The sessions are free to the public under the Louisiana State Opioid Response Grant, referred to as LASOR. Completing is not forgetting. As we prepare to write a goodbye letter, it is important to remember that completing a relationship does not mean that you have to forget the person. We recognize that people desire to keep some fond memories of their family and friends. Remember, you are completing your relationship to the pain caused by the loss. You are letting go of the pain. Saying goodbye. The goodbye letter is for you. If your letter is addressed to a living person, it is not to be read or delivered to that person. Once your letter is complete, you will read the letter to yourself. This is a format of a goodbye letter. You will start your letter with a salutation. Use the name or title that best represents how you remember the person, for example, dear dad. Listed is a suggested statement to begin the body of the letter. I have been reviewing our relationship and I have discovered some things that I want to tell you. The body of your goodbye letter will consist of apologies, forgiveness, and significant emotional statements. When apologies, forgiveness, and significant emotional statements are made, you will state the name or title of the person that the goodbye letter is addressed to. For example, Dad, I apologize for not wishing you a happy birthday. Dad, I forgive you for not taking me to the father-daughter dinner. Dad, I want you to know that I am really angry with you. The most effective way to write your letter is to have at hand your relationship graph, your list of apologies, forgiveness, and emotional statements. Now, there is no limit on how much you can write, but emotional intensity is often lost in volume. Generally, two or three standard pages are sufficient. It's okay to write a little more or a little less. If you write more than five pages, you might want to consider that you might be repeating some of the same things. Closing your goodbye letter. The grief recovery method is about completion. In order to complete what you have discovered, you must end your letter effectively. If the statements, I love you, I miss you, are not true, then don't say them. You can use an alternate statement, such as, I have to go now, and I have to let go of the pain. Goodbye, Dad. Or you can create other closing statements based on your unique relationship. What should remain constant are the words, goodbye. Failure to say these words can oftentimes take away all the good work you have done. It's the goodbye that completes the communication. Now, let's look at a completed goodbye letter. Dear Dad, I have been reviewing our relationship and I have discovered some things that I want to tell you. Dad, I want to apologize for calling you a worthless father. Dad, I forgive you for not being there when I needed you the most. Dad, I want you to know that although I have called you a lot of horrible names and stopped talking to you, I really do love you from the depth of my soul. I have to go now and I have to let go of the pain. Goodbye, Dad. Under the Louisiana State OPR Response Grant, again referred to as LASOR, Northeast Delta Human Services Authority has a mobile crisis team that consists of a manager, a nurse, peer support specialist, and a grief counselor. The Louisiana State OPR Response Program is designed to enhance existing statewide prevention, treatment, and recovery support services for individuals with or at risk for opioid use disorder. 
Northeast Delta Human Services Authority Opioid Misuse and Abuse Prevention Program provides the following services. Narcan education and distribution to increase awareness and reduce the occurrence of opioid-related overdoses. The terror education and distribution, which is used to deactivate and dispose of unused or expired medications safely in your home. Peer support, a mobile service provided through the crisis mobile team by a certified peer support specialist who serves as a guide to those in recovery by using their own lived experiences and training to help discover a path of recovery. Generation RX, an evidence-based program that educates students, adults, and older adults about the potential dangers of misusing prescription medications. National Prescription Take Back Day, held every April and October nationally to bring awareness to the harmful effects and consequences of having used and or expired medications in the home. Grief counseling, a mobile service provided through the crisis mobile team facilitated by groups in an effort to support individuals and families that have been affected by the misuse and abuse of opioids and other substances. Due to COVID-19, Northeast Delta Human Services Authority is looking to provide grief recovery sessions virtually. It is our goal to build relationships in the community and to provide grief recovery for those in need. This concludes the grief recovery training. Thank you for your participation. Again, I welcome emails and telephone calls if you have questions and concerns. My email, as you see listed, is Nina, N-E-N-A dot Littleberry, L-I-T-T-L-E-B-E-R-R-Y at L-A dot G-O-V. My contact number is 318-362-4617. Now, I will turn things over to Alan for our question and answers opportunity. Thank you, Nina. We will now take questions via the Zoom chat feature. If we are unable to address your question today due to time or other constraints, we will follow up via email as soon as possible. Now that being said, we did have some persons, uh, some individuals provide some questions prior to today's webinar. So I will start with those questions. Nina? How does grief impact my physical health? Thank you for that question. Very good question. As uh, we are concerned about our health, the stress of grief can have some significant physical effects on the body. Grief can cause you to feel fatigue from the emotional stress. The fatigue can develop into headaches. Persons have been known to suffer with anxiety when grieving. If you have existing health problems, for example, hypertension, grief can exacerbate your existing medical conditions. Grief can attack your immune system, leaving you vulnerable for infection, creating new medical problems for you. So certainly, um, it can have a significant impact on us physically. Thank you, Nina. Another question that was submitted beforehand, you mentioned Louisiana State opioid response quite a number of times. Must the person be in opioid recovery to participate in the grief counseling that you discussed? Thank you for that question. Northeast Delta has been fortunate to provide grief recovery counseling in some of the residential substance abuse treatment facilities as well as provide grief recovery education to community resources where the population served are vulnerable to the misuse are vulnerable to the misuse and abuse of opioids and additional substances. Grief recovery meets people wherever they are in the recovery process. They could be in recovery or they could have relapsed. Northeast Delta offers this service to any citizen in need in the 12 parishes service areas.
Thank you, Nina. How soon can a person start grief counseling? Very good question. It depends on the individual. Grief is different and unique according to the person. When the person feels like they have come to a place in their life when they are now ready to start to work on the healing process of their grief, this is typically a good place and a time to start. For each individual, readiness will vary, and that's okay. And the final pre-submitted question at this time, and then we'll uh, look at the chat questions that have been submitted. The final pre-submitted question, can children use grief recovery? Awesome question. This model of grief recovery that was presented this afternoon is specifically tailored for adults. However, the Grief Recovery Institute does have a grief recovery model to address children and adolescents. Thank you, Nina. Now, there are some questions that have been um, submitted via the Zoom chat feature. If we, if we Northeast Delta does, does not have the perfect answer for you now, we will respond to you via email afterwards. So looking in the chat here, Nina, um, can, can you provide any information on becoming a certified grief counselor? Um, yes, I can. The Grief Re Recovery Institute is the uh, agency that does the training and provides the certification for a grief recovery method specialist. I can follow up with you later and give you that information, how to get in contact with that uh, institution if you are interested in applying uh, to get certification and training. And it looks like there's one other question. Uh, some say that grief does not have an expiration date. How, what would you say on that? Thank you for that question. Um, again, grief is tailored toward the person and it's unique how that person, people grieve sometimes from things that happened 20 and 30 years ago. So again, it is about that individual. And so when it comes to an expiration date, um, it is not an expiration date because we do, we are different and we grieve differently. Thank you for joining us today. Please visit our website at www.nedeltahsa.org and follow us on our various social media handles at NEDeltaHSA. Please join us on future presentations of this webinar series by the Prevention and Wellness Team at Northeast Delta HSA. We are here to improve education awareness, advance community discourse, and focus on recovery during social distancing and other issues enhanced by COVID-19. Together, we, Northeast Delta Human Services Authority and you, are building stronger communities together, one person at a time.